This needs to be said first and foremost. All views expressed in this video are my own, not necessarily shared with the creators of Digimon Digital Adventures, and this video is definitely not officially sponsored by them, Toei, Bandai, or anyone else with the rights to Digimon or the system at hand. This is part two of a video series on Digimon Digital Adventures. If you know about Digimon and tabletop role-playing games, you can start here, which I'd assume you did, considering I advised you to do so in the last video if you had that knowledge. But if you don't, go watch part one for a brief explanation of both of these things first, otherwise you're going to be very, very confused. So this part is going to be covering human character creation in Digimon Digital Adventures. Thing is, you play both the human and the Digimon, and uh, you kind of have to make two characters, though really it's a little bit more than that. We'll get more into that in the Digimon video, which will be the next one. For now, all you need to know is that compared to Digimon, humans are pretty simple to create since they only really have skills, stats, derived stats, and a few other things that I'll cover a bit later in the video. Since Digimon have much more to look over and work with, that video might be a little longer, even if I'm not going to go super in-depth on it because there's just so much there and really you should read the book and learn about each different ability that a Digimon can have on your own time. It will sort of give more of an overview. The same applies here with humans, where I'm going to go over all the different parts, but I'm only going to give brief explanations and what I think applies to certain parts. I still recommend you read the book and get that information for yourself. So, what do humans do in Digimon Digital Adventures? Well, according to the developer, RKD, they're meant to be skill monkeys. Whereas the Digimon are there to do the fighting and the beating up and, you know, help with human character development by being a complement or contrast, humans are generally meant to be your quote-unquote main character. They have the most role-playing mechanics, they have the skills and stats, and are generally better at skill checks, unless the Digimon takes a few abilities, which again, we'll touch on in that video very briefly. So your human probably shouldn't be getting involved in fights as much as I would love to be able to emulate my boy Masaru from Digimon Savers. Not the best idea, for a number of reasons, which we'll get into in later sections. Mainly, they don't have enough durability, and they don't do enough damage, and generally don't have enough accuracy, especially in the late game, where numbers can get pretty crazy, to really compete. So maybe the first session, maybe the first two sessions, but eventually they're just gonna stop being useful in fights. So yeah, don't, don't, don't try and man fight a Digimon, because that will end poorly. So in Digimon, your human is called a tamer, because, well, they tame a Digimon. And ideally, they should have a few things they're good at to match their personality. When you're making a character with DDA, um, you need to remember it's a narrative system first and foremost. So, who your character is should influence what they're able to do. At least to some degree. The Digimon, we'll get into that next video, don't worry too much about it, but for your human specifically, who they are should influence what they do. That's my opinion on it. Again, disclaimer at the start of the video, doesn't represent necessarily the views of the people who make the game, but that's how I'd go about it personally, especially for a narrative-focused game like DDA, where that's important. It'll help you play into your character more, even if you may have weaker aspects, which is fine, that's normal, that's good. So the things they're good at are represented not just by their stats and skills, but by a few other mechanics that I'm going to touch on shortly. When you're making your tamer, keep in mind who they are, what they enjoy, what they don't enjoy, like, things they're good at, things they're not good at, that sort of thing. This will be important because it'll make the mechanics match up with the flavor of your character, and then when you play the character, it'll all just, it'll all just happen. It'll be easy. It'll save you trouble. Now, Digimon Digital Adventures has three tiers of play. These used to be divided purely by age range in 1.3, but in 1.4, age ranges are more of a general recommendation for that power level. Uh, and, again, they've been turned more into power levels than age groups. The three levels are Standard, Enhanced, and Extreme. And on screen right now, you can see how those break down, and you might see some terms that don't make any sense to you. And that's okay, I'm going to explain these terms. First off is Campaign Level. This is the tier of play you're at. 
This is basically a measure of how much power the GM wants the players to have. So for lower powered games, or games that are going to be shorter, you might want to go with standard. It's easier to reach the caps of your stats, so you don't need as much bonus DP or XP to reach those levels, and thus you can get some of your other stuff that I'll talk about in a minute a bit easier. And that's good for short games, you know? It's a limit on how strong humans can be, however, so they won't be quite as useful. But again, it, it's going to reduce your maximums that you need to reach your skills and stat maximums, so you need less XP, which means you can actually have a few more depending on how long the game is. But I'm going to cover XP and DP in a later video, along with another mechanic that we'll get to later, so don't worry about that for now. You have a limited pool and a smaller recommended area cap, which means you're going to be losing a little versatility at the lowest tier. So Enhanced is my favorite tier of play, uh, because I find that it, it finds a good balance between standard and extreme, and offers a great play experience over a long-term game. Like, if you're going to be playing for a year, year and a half, two years, you may want to go for Enhanced. So I play in two games right now, and run one. And uh, the two I play in have both been running for about a year, and according to the dev, we are pushing the limits of how much bonus DP we should have, but honestly, I don't mind it. The game's a bit tougher as a result. If that's what you're going for, fine. You know, by about a year, you could have about 70 bonus DP. But if you're not going for something that hard, just as the GM scale back how much DP you give out, problem solved. And again, we'll touch on that in a later video. So why should you run enhanced? First of all, it gives the human player characters a little more customization. You get more points, and while your t your caps are higher, you know, it's fine. Generally, the game is going to run long enough for you to get at least one stat up to its highest level, and then you can get access to some stuff that we're going to talk about in a minute. Maxing out your stats and skills is a little bit tougher because the cost is higher, and that's why I say it's better for long-term games, because you're going to need the time to earn the bonus XP and be able to spend it. And again, we're going to cover that later. Don't worry too much about it. This is just an overview. Last tier is Extreme. I have no experience with it. Everyone who talks about it says it sounds daunting and terrifying, but that's because humans get a lot of points and their caps are higher, and it's harder to max out your stats and skills than anything else. If your game is going to run to very high numbers of bonus XP, and your game is going to run for like two, three, four years somehow, I. I don't know how you're going to stretch out, <laughs> I don't know how you're going to stretch out a game of DDA that long, because, I mean, what, are you, I, I guess you could just do like Adventure did and just make like 50 different continuations, like Try and Kizuna, that we talked about in the first video, but I don't know how you do that. Otherwise, it's for games where you just want players to be strong from the start. So you could also potentially use it for shorter games uh, where you just want Digimon or like one shots where you just want everyone to be really powerful right out of the gate. It has the highest amount of points, the highest caps. It takes a lot of XP to reach your caps. So only really run it if you want a short game with really powerful characters or a really, really long game where it gets really, really hard in the late game because it will because you'll everything will be stronger to scale with you, obviously. Obviously, if you're a player, discuss with your GM what power level you're at before you make your character. That's number one, important. If you have a question, don't look to the internet, don't go to 4chan, don't go to Reddit, don't go to Twitter, don't go to the official server. Talk to your GM and, you know, ask them. Be like, hey, wh what power level are we using for this game? And they'll tell you. And if they don't, it might be time to find a new GM. So, now that we've discussed campaign level, let's move on to something a little more self-explanatory with age range. It's the recommended player character age range for the tier of play. If your GM says, we're playing enhanced, I want your characters to be within this age range. You make a character whose age is 12 to 20. There you go. It's really that simple, so we're just gonna move right on to starting CP. CP stands for character points, and human characters have a fixed amount of these at start, and you spend them to boost your stats and skills on a one-to-one -one basis. So, let's say if you want to put a point into agility, you spend 1 CP. There you go. You now have 1 agility and 39 CP, say you're playing on enhanced. Standard has 30 CP, 
Enhanced has 40, and Extreme has 50. And this is what you start with, and you don't get any more later. And it's very hard to raise stats and skills with XP, so keep that in mind. Uh, again, we'll touch on that in a later video. Starting caps. Your starting cap is absolutely the highest you can have any single skill or stat at character creation. Not all of them. You can only have one skill and one stat at this number. So on an enhanced character, you could have your agility at 5 and your persuasion at 5, but everything else has to be 4 or less. You have to basically make it so that it, once you've got your 2 at your cap, everything else has to be 1 less or lower. Any other increases after this point, and if you want to get above that cap later, you have to spend XP, which we'll discuss in a later video as I've already said. So your final cap is the absolute maximum any stat or skill can be. To get to this, you have to spend XP. Again, we'll talk about that in a later video, so don't worry too much about it now. Do know this is the most you can have, and it differs for each tier. For example, the most you can have in a stat with the enhanced tier is 7. So you can't have anything higher than 7, which means the highest you can add to a roll, which again, we'll discuss later in another video dedicated to the rolls in the game, is a bonus of 14. And that's assuming you have 7 in the stat and 7 in the skill relevant to the stat. So your area cap is the recommended amount of points you can spend maximum on skills or stats. So for instance with enhanced, right? You have 40 CP. You can only spend 20 of that on stats and 20 of that on skills. You don't have to because you can sort of... There's other things you can spend it on, which again, we'll get to later. The GM can change this if they want, and there are some recommended spreads. Personally, I like the ones that they have in the book. I think they're really good. Any more, and you get into some really wonky territory with very skewed characters, which can be fun to have characters with extremes, but it can also hinder your characters a bit. So maybe just use the ones in the book, unless you're feeling adventurous. So you may have heard me use the term stats up until this point. That is technically not correct. They are called attributes, but I'm going to call them stats. So when I say stats, I mean attributes. Moving on. So in DDA, humans have five stats. These are agility, body, charisma, intelligence, and willpower. And each of these stats has three unique skills that they fall under with a specific purpose. It's important to note, if you have a zero in a skill, you actually take a minus one penalty to any skill check you make, which represents your character's inability to use that skill effectively. So let's say you made a stealth check to try and hide. You would add your agility, and let's say you have, let's just say you have three agility, your character's not very agile, it's kind of a fat ass. Then you would add your stealth, which is zero, but that would actually be a minus one. So you would roll 3d6 plus 3 minus 1. Again, we'll get more into rolls later, but that's how the general skill rolls work. So first up is agility. According to the document, agility is your human character's manual dexterity and reflexes. I would say a character with high agility is either a good fighter, good at moving silently, or really good at getting out of the way of danger. If you absolutely have to play a combat tamer, you want high agility, you know, Maybe they're also easy to overlook as a person if they have low charisma or willpower and high stealth. Maybe they're just really good at getting out of the way. Or maybe they're a martial artist, you know? Maybe they do martial arts. That's something that you could work into your character. The three agility skills are dodge, fight, and stealth. Character with high dodge can avoid attacks in combat, but also environmental hazards like falling rock. High fight means your character loves to throw hands, whether they're a martial artist, a street brawler, just a punk, whatever. They are damn good at hitting things, although I don't think I've ever seen it used outside of combat. If you want to know how to use it outside of combat, I recommend heading over to the official server, which I believe is linked in the documentation, and asking the dev, RKD. A high stealth means the character is good at moving without being detected, though again, it might mean they're just easy to overlook. They don't have much of a presence, especially with low willpower or charisma. So play that however you want. Maybe they like to get into trouble and they sneak around and pull pranks on people. You know, something like that. Try and justify your point purchases on your human in character. That's what I'm saying. And I'm going to keep making suggestions like this for all the other stats, so get used to it. 
Next up is body, and body is your character's strength and general hardiness. It's how tough they are, and a character with high body is athletic, strong, or able, or just able to take a beating or deal with the elements. If your character has a high body, maybe give him a hobby like playing sports, being on the track team at school, rock climbing, you know, something athletic. And this is because body skills are athletics, endurance, and feats of strength. A character with high athletics likely has a sport that involves running, or maybe they're a competitive swimmer, something that involves physical activity, as athletics is used as a skill check for climbing, jumping, and running, and swimming, and that sort of thing. Characters with a high endurance are probably just hardy, a bit tougher, used to roughing it a bit. They can go without creature comforts for a long time, stuff like air conditioning, a warm bed, that sort of thing. And maybe they also enjoy camping, if they have a high survival too. If your character has a high feats of strength, they're probably just really strong. Maybe they're a teenager who works a stocking job at not Amazon. Maybe they lift weights for fun and hit the gym. They're a gym bro. They also have high athletics, so you know, that's part of their character. Think about that. Charisma is a measure of your character's ability to impose their will on others or just be persuasive. A character with high charisma will probably look good and also be really good at talking to others. Specifically, talking people down, convincing them to do what they want. In short, charisma is your social stat. And uh, if your charisma is high, your character should be at least somewhat of a social butterfly. Uh, that, or they're really, really good at faking it. Having a character who's in, like, drama or theater club in their school. Maybe they like to crack jokes. Maybe they're just a nice guy. I, I think all that could fit into charisma, and... You should consider that when making your character. The charisma skills include manipulate, perform, and persuade. Although, in 1.4 it's called persuasion. Not a big difference, but it is. So if I accidentally call it persuade, it's because I'm used to 1.3, forgive me. The skills are a bit trickier to define and generally up to the GM, but I would say manipulate means you're good at lying and convincing people with misdirection or lies. Your character might be a bit of a troublemaker, they might be a bit of a fake, that sort of thing. High perform means your character probably has some training or skill at an art such as drawing, playing a musical instrument, singing, dancing, that sort of thing. So keep that in mind, make it part of the character. If your character's got high persuasion, it means that the character is good at convincing others to help them honestly. You could argue that intimidation falls under manipulate if it's a lie, if they're making a threat they can't follow up on, but if they're making a threat they can follow up on, it would be persuasion. That would be my judgment. Uh, ultimately, it's up to your game master, so ask them, and don't point to this video and go, But Smug said that this is how it works! Because ultimately, rule zero, which I didn't talk about in the other video and I should have, is when the GM says something, the GM is correct. So if the GM tells you this is not a persuade check, this is a manipulate check for this intimidation, you, you, you just do it. Don't, don't make his life a living hell, and he'll probably not treat you like garbage. Intelligence is a mix of both your book smarts and your technical knowledge as a character. It's effectively how wrinkly or smooth your character's brain is. Characters with high intelligence are probably going to be very good with machines and computers, well-read and knowledgeable about history, or just skilled at survival, and will either be your computer nerds like Koshiro, from Adventure, who's known as Izzy in the dub, or maybe they're bookworms. Again, if they have high endurance, they're probably into camping, so they know a lot about nature and survival and that sort of thing. If they are computer savvy, it might pay to have them carry a tablet, a smartphone, a laptop, you know, something along those lines to sort of help play into that. So your intelligence skills are computer, survival, and knowledge. Characters with high computer are probably good at technical stuff, they're computer whizzes, they're your tech support, and, you know, probably spend their free time coding or doing other computery stuff. A character with high survival is really the opposite. Have a high endurance if you have a high survival. That will make it so that it seems like your character camps, you know, they spend time outdoors, they know their way around. They know what not to wipe with when camping. Finally, a high knowledge means that the character is probably a bookworm who spends a lot of their time reading and studying, and they might even have a near photographic memory if it's high enough. Knowledge characters are your big brains. They, they know a lot of stuff, and that can be really helpful. So the final stat is willpower, and it's a measure of how strongly your character feels about themselves and how determined they are. It's also their perceptiveness, 
A character with high willpower is not only brave and perceptive, but uh, they're also capable of using that bravery and perceptiveness to do some crazy stuff that other characters just can't do. If your character has high willpower, they're probably very courageous or perceptive. They might be a member of a debate club if their charisma is also pretty high. They might also be a risk taker. You know, they might throw themselves into danger on a whim because they have a good feeling about things. They're also really good at reading other people. They might also be a little bit self-absorbed and a little bit arrogant, though. So be sure to play into that, you know, because not every character trait has to be positive, but mind yourself. Don't do not do it to the point where you annoy the rest of the people at the table. And maybe make it part of their art. Make them go from being a self-absorbed, arrogant douche to being an alright guy who's still confident in himself. So the willpower skills are perception, decipher, intent, and bravery. Perception is used, well, like every other tabletop game. You use it to spot stuff and see things in the environment. It's also sort of your investigation skill, though that could also be argued to be decipher intent. A character with high perception probably has a good eye for detail, and they're also pretty good at picking up on social cues and adapting. A character with high decipher intent is probably good at using common sense to figure out how something works, rather than having a technical understanding like someone with high knowledge or computer will. They're also really good at reading the room, and if someone's lying to them, they're probably going to notice. If you want to be able to be a walking lie detector, put points into this. A character with high bravery will probably never back down even from the biggest, baddest Digimon. The documentation itself notes that when players are put into extreme situations of great stress or something that could be scary, they should roll bravery. It mentions that freedom and liberty to react to things is important, but bravery means there's going to be instances where players shouldn't be able to just shrug something off. So if they're fighting something big and scary, they need to roll bravery, and if they fail bravery, that maybe they can't react, maybe they freeze up, maybe they get scared. It's really up to the GM, and it's one of those things that the GM sort of needs to set a precedent for and then stick to it. You don't have to set it up before the game, but you do need to set a precedent and then stick to it and be consistent. That is important as a GM, especially with skills like this. At the end of the day, your human character stats and skills should fall in line with their personality and what they enjoy in their free time or put their effort into normally. You can do the reverse, you can make your stats and then build a character around it, but I would argue that doing the former is better. That's due to a mechanic we're about to discuss in a little bit called aspects. Once I explain those and you understand them, you should have a good understanding of why I think that. For now, though, we need to move on to derived stats. So your derived stats are six stats made up of your stats and skills as a human. They apply to combat, so I'm probably going to touch on them more in that video, but for now, here's your formulas for them and what they're called. They're on screen, and you'll just have to deal with that for now until I get around to the video on combat. This is probably my favorite part of 1.4. At first, I wasn't really into them, but when they finished, oh man, they give your humans extra abilities based on their stats. Here's some important stuff you need to know about them. First and foremost, you have to meet the stat requirement to use them, meaning you'll only have one special order at character creation. That's right, one of your stats will meet the requirement, and that will be the one that you put a 5 in if it's, say, enhanced. They only last for the round they're used unless they say they're passive, or otherwise state that they last longer, such as until the end of the fight. Lastly, they cannot be chained into each other on the same turn. You can only use one special order per turn, and you cannot use them on any Digimon other than your own partner, unless it specifies an enemy Digimon as a target, in which case, you can only use it on that. You can't use the beneficial ones on your allies, that's what I'm saying. Each stat has three special orders associated with it, and each has an associated stat requirement. For standard, these are 3, 4, and 5. For Enhanced, they're 5, 6, and 7, and for Extreme, they're a little weird at 6, 8, and 10. You automatically gain access to a special order as soon as you hit the value for it. Well, if I get a bit excited about some of these, I can't help it, because there's some really cool names and some really cool abilities that just make me happy. So first, we're going to start with Agility. Its special orders are Strike First, Strike Fast, and Strike Last! Yes, with the exclamation marks. That's right. They're part of the book, and it's I, I'm glad for it. So Strike First is a passive boost to your Digimon. It gives them plus one to their initiative rolls, and plus two to their movement speed. This means your Digimon will be able to move earlier in combat, which is going to be relevant later when I talk about combat. 
We'll get to that. But more importantly, they get to move a little further when they take the movement action. Since Digimon have fixed movement based on their stage that can only be increased by their qualities, this is a really good bonus if you want a Digimon that's super aggressive and focused on melee combat. Strike Fast is a once per day complex action, meaning your tamer can do nothing else during their half of your turn. We'll discuss that more in the combat section, but for now you need to know that there are two types of actions in Digimon Digital Adventures. Simple and complex. You can either take two simple actions or one complex action on either character's turn. You can't combine them unless there's you do some other shenanigans, but we'll talk about that in a different section. For now, just assume that if it's a complex action, you can only you basically use your tamer's turn to do it, and if it's a simple action, you still have one more of those left over. Strike fast means your tamer lets you target any Digimon that has moved this turn and have its dodge pool rounding down against a single attack from your partner Digimon. You can't trigger the huge power or overkill qualities, which we'll talk about later in the Digimon video, which is the next one by the way, stay tuned for that. It can be a really great way to make sure your most powerful moves hit hard. The last agility order is called Strike Last, and it lets you, once per day, take the intercede action, which it's basically like a reaction in Dungeons and Dragons. It eats up a simple action on your next turn, and again, I'll go into depth on that in the combat section. By doing this, you can apply the counter blow quality, whether the Digimon manages to dodge or not. Even if they don't have the counter blow quality, you can apply it. You can't trigger huge overkill or huge power on this, but it's good. Again, we'll discuss counter blow in its own part in the Digimon video. Basically, it's sort of a counter-attack type of deal. So, yeah. Really good. So, there's a reason to have agility beyond having a combat tamer. It means that your Digimon is just better at fighting. So, next up are the body special order. The names of them are Energy Burst, Enduring Soul, and Finishing Touch. Energy Burst is the once-per-day complex action your tamer can take. But doing so immediately heals your Digimon for 5 wound boxes, which is basically hit points. And again, we'll get to that later. Enduring Soul is actually a passive, and it's also really good. If your Digimon would take a blow that would bring them to zero wound boxes once per fight, they just survive with one instead, is Finishing Touch. As a simple action, once per day or session, any single attack that your Digimon uses of your choice treats fours as successes, as well as fives and sixes. Again, we'll get to that later, but that's really good. That basically gives you a 50% chance of succeeding on any D6 in your attack pool. You can't use huge power overkill with this either, but I argue this is more consistent. Because huge power and overkill Digimon can have a tendency to get really screwed over by threes and fours. Next up, Charisma. And these are really good. I really like these. They're not super useful compared to Direct with Charisma in some situations, but in others they can be super good, and you can also do both in one turn, provided the order is a simple action. The special orders for Charisma are Swagger, Peak Performance, and Guiding Light. Swagger is a once per battle simple action that applies the Taunt effect to any target of your choice for three rounds, with your Digimon becoming the target based on your Digimon CPU times two as normal. Again, we'll discuss effects in the section on Digimon. There's an entire list of them, and we'll go over all of them then. But for now, all you need to know is that this applies the taunt effect. Peak Performance is a once-per-day complex action, and it grants a unique Bastion buff to your partner. It gives a flat plus two to all of their stats except for health for a full round. You can't give it to allies, but two dice can make or break an effect being applied to an attack with damage. The final one is called Guiding Light, and it's very powerful. It's a passive buff that gives plus two accuracy to all allies within the burst radius of your Digimon. We'll discuss this more in the Digimon section. So if you don't know what burst radius is, it's basically a radius based on some of your stats centered on your Digimon. And again, you'll know the exact numbers in the next video. But this also feeds back into your Digimon, because every allied Digimon within their burst radius gives them a plus one to dodge. So you're giving your allies bonus accuracy and giving your Digimon more dodge, which is great for a dodge tank, which is a thing you can do in DDA and it can be really good. Next is Intelligence. The orders here are Quick Reaction, Enemy Scan, and Decimation. Quick Reaction is a once per day intercede action, and it lets you give your Digimon their stage bonus plus two in dodge dice for the rest of the round. 
Uh, stage bonus is a stat for Digimon, and we'll talk about that in the next video. But normally when you direct a Digimon, they only get the bonus for one attack. With this, it diminishes normally. So rather than all of this bonus going away at once after the first dodge, it just drops normally until the end of the round. And then it goes away. Enemy Scan is a once-per-battle complex action that applies the special Debilitate debuff to any enemy that you choose to use it on. It reduces all of their stats except for health by two for a full round, but doesn't stack with itself, so you can't have two Tamers use this on the same target. The final one is Decimation, and it's a complex action once per day. You can make the cooldown of your Digimon's signature move two rounds instead of three. We're going to discuss signature moves in the Digimon section, but they're really, 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 really good, and you absolutely should try and get one if you've got the DP for it. Lastly, we have the Willpower Special Orders. Though they're Tough It Out, Challenger, and Fateful Intervention. Tough It Out is a once-per-battle complex action, but it lets your Digimon end a negative effect on themselves by using your Tamer's complex action. Challenger is passive, and it means your Digimon gains 2 plus 1, maximum 5, wound boxes for every stage higher the main enemy is than your Digimon's base stage. Now, the book doesn't clarify what a main enemy is, but uh, that's something you should ask your GM. And also, I would argue, for GMs, it means the strongest enemy, which we'll discuss later in the GM section, but talk to your GM about it when you get the order, and they should be able to tell you which one looks the strongest. Uh, the last one is Fateful Intervention, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit when we talk about Inspiration, because it's tied into that, and it's really, really good. Like, we're talking legit the best ability in the game, in my opinion, because, like, there's just nothing that matches it. Moving on, we're going to talk about Aspects. Now, if any of you have ever played Fate, you might know the term and it's a very similar mechanic from what I understand, because this system used to be a weird hybrid of Shadowrun and Fate, but that's changed a lot over the years. What are Aspects? Aspects basically tie the flavor of your character into the mechanics. You have two Aspects, a Major and a Minor. Major Aspects provide a plus four bonus or a minus four penalty to certain skill checks associated with it, and they represent something obvious about your human character. Uh, the book has examples, I'm going to do an example character at the end of these, this series, so I'll have some examples there. Minor aspects only provide a plus two or minus two penalty, or bonus, bonus or penalty rather, and uh, they represent a core part of your human that might not be immediately obvious. So, you know, it's, it's part of who they are, but they don't advertise it like they would their major. Major aspects can only be activated by a player once per in-game day or once per session, whichever comes first. Minor aspects can be activated twice in the same time frame. However, if you opt to take the negative aspect of, uh, well, your aspect, you can regain a single use of either your major or minor aspect once per in-game day. You can apply these to combat roles too, you know, if your tamer is suicidal, I guess by bolstering dodger accuracy pool by the same amount. They apply the same amount of dice to the pools that you would to a skill check. I wouldn't recommend this, again, because combat tamers just, they're too squishy to really be reliable, but you can do it. And again, I'll cover this more in the video on combat and dice rolling. Now, major and minor aspects shouldn't be too specific. They shouldn't just say it gives a bonus to this and this. It should be more of a general concept about your character. It should be, like a description of that aspect of your character's personality. That's why it's an aspect. The document has specific examples via the example tamers and some examples in the section in the book. Uh, I'm gonna make my own example character at the end of these videos, uh, the series of videos rather, not the each individual one. And by doing that, I'll be able to show you step by step how it works. I'm gonna live stream that, so follow me on Twitch and Twitter if you wanna know when that is. So aspects aren't the only thing that your human has to help them flesh them out. They also have some fears that they have to deal with, and these are called torments. Torments come in three flavors, minor, major, and terrible. Minor torments are simple fears, stuff like worrying about whether or not you can actually make friends, maybe worrying about your parents getting divorced, something that's not like super scary, but it is scary to you, and that's what matters. Major torments are a bit rougher, and they're things like a crippling fear of being alone, being afraid of your only sibling coming to harm, since you have to care for them, that sort of thing. 
Now, Terrible Torments are special. You don't start with them, and they're only really given out due to traumatic events that happen during the game. But things like watching a friend die in front of you can cause one of these to manifest. So each human starts with either two minor or one major torment, though you can ask your GM to take more, and your GM might demand you take more depending on the tone of the game. So ultimately ask your GM how many torments and which types you should have. Each torment has a specific number of torment boxes that need to be checked off to overcome it. Minors have five, majors have seven, and terrible torments have ten. So there's two ways to mark off torment boxes. The first is the simplest. With GM permission, you can spend XP to check them off. You need permission from the GM, and we'll discuss the exact values later in a different video. The other method that is most common is succeeding on a torment check. You can force your character to make a torment check once per session of your own will, but uh, everything after the GM can do of their own choice. So if the GM wants to make you roll like five torment checks in a session, they can. They shouldn't, probably, but they can. A personal recommendation is to make your own torment check at least a couple of times to give your GM a sense of what sets it off. If he knows, then he can do it himself later and you'll have a better chance of ch ticking off these boxes and overcoming your torments. Now, torment checks are 3d6 plus your willpower stat plus any check boxes you have on that torment minus however many unchecked boxes you have on that torment. You have to hit 12 to succeed, and if you succeed, you check off a box and overcome your torment. However, failure can mean a few different things. If you if you roll 6 to 11, your character is probably going to become withdrawn, quiet, not involved, and uh, they may not participate in combat anymore if they're in the middle of it. Rolling a 1 to a 5 will result in a critical failure, and at that point your character is going to get upset, might even snap at the rest of the party, or even run away and just bail on them. Last one's not likely, but hey, it's a possibility. Just don't do that too often or you're, everyone else at the table is going to get annoyed. But if you roll a 0 or less, somehow, this is basically the worst possible scenario. You're probably definitely going to run away at this point. Uh, but if it's during a fight, you're probably going to snap, break down, and uh, you might even dark evolve your partner, which we're going to touch on much later, but believe you me, we are going to definitely get into that, because Dark of Evolution is just, it's a really neat mechanic for roleplaying, trust me. Still, things are always darkest before the dawn. And there is a mechanic you can use to help you subvert a failure on a torment check, or any check at all, really. That mechanic is called Inspiration. It is probably one of the coolest things about DDA, because it puts the power into the hands of the players, letting them tilt the odds in their favor at crucial moments by playing their characters well and acting despite the mechanical or out-of-character detriments that might come of it. You can only have inspiration equal to your willpower stat at most, but having enough will let you completely turn things around in your favor and change the fate of the game itself. There are four ways to use inspiration. Rerolling dice, acts of inspiration, divine protection, and fateful intervention. Each has its own costs and benefits, and all of them are completely able to upend a terrible situation and turn it back on the player's side. Rerolling is simple. You spend a single point of inspiration, and you get to reroll a skill check or dice pool. This can be any skill check or dice pool, even in enemies. You can also bolster the roll by spending extra inspiration after spending the first. Increasing or decreasing the result of the pool size by how many you spend at a rate of 1 to 1. For example, you can make the enemy Digimon re-roll their attack with a minus 2 penalty. It can be pretty useful, but it's not the most powerful ability. We're gonna get to that. Uh, neither is this next one, but it is strong. Acts of Inspiration require the use of one less than your starting cap in Inspiration. Two for Standard, four for Enhanced, and six for Extreme. By spending that much Inspiration, you get to add or subtract five from any check or dice pool. This can turn a hit into a miss, a miss into a hit, or a failure into success. Divine Protection is usually free, and we're going to touch on that in the combat section, but if you want to use it more than once, you're going to have to spend two Inspiration to use it. The last and most powerful ability of Inspiration is Fateful Intervention. It's so strong, it's the final Willpower Special Order. You have to have your maximum Inspiration, 5 for Standard, 7 for Enhanced, or 10 for Extreme, but by spending all of it, you get a very powerful ability. Not only do you get the benefits of an act of inspiration, where you get to add or subtract 5 to the check, but you also get to add or subtract your character's willpower from the result, which will be a 5, 7, or 10, which is insane. And the best part? You choose the results of any dice that are rolled. If it's a skill check, you can be looking at a base roll of 30 on that skill check. And that's before attributes and skills. If it's a Digimon's attack, not only are they going to have full successes, 
but you'll be looking at an additional 12 on top of that, which can absolutely lead to an incredibly powerful blow that ends a fight in a dramatic fashion. Fateful Intervention is one of my favorite mechanics I've ever seen in a tabletop game, and it sucks that I've never had the chance to use it because I've never played a character with high enough full power. And uh, my group is kind of not... We, we keep forgetting about inspiration, so we've started using one of the variant rules from 1.4, which I'll talk about later. But it's just so powerful, and it's basically crazy anime bullshit. It is the crazy anime bullshit the ability, and it's so cool. There is a big incentive to max your willpower, and that is it. It can, it can let you do some really cool dramatic stuff, and it's just... I love it. It's good. I, I can't praise it enough. God, I love this game. GMs should hand out inspiration for good role-playing on the part of the players, but if you're not super great about that and you don't really want to, you can just use the variant rule, which we'll touch on in the GM video like my group does. And now it's time for my subjective advice. Uh, as stated at the start in the little disclaimer, these are my views, not necessarily represent the views of RKD, blah 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 blah. Point one. When you're making player characters, sit down with the rest of the group, have, have something called Session Zero. Everyone gets together, sets up their expectations for the game, discusses their character concepts, the GM sets up any limitations on what Digimon can and can't be used, any variant or house rules he's using, that sort of thing. The reasons for this are a few. First and foremost, make sure your character fits the tone of the game. If you're going to play something more serious, akin to Digimon Tamers, then, you know, making a goofball comic relief character might not be the best call. I mean, sure, there could be room for it, but like, if all they do is be haha goofy funny man, you're gonna stand out and it might be annoying. Uh, similar, if you're gonna play something a little sillier like Digimon Savers themed, where, you know, punching Digimon to power up your own is a thing, you might not want to make a broody angst lord who takes everything super seriously and whose parents are dead. Uh, this also lets the GM tell you how many torments you should have, the stats, skill splits, etc, etc. All of which are sort of part of the expectations for the game. Second, it helps you have a more unique character. And while there can be some interesting stuff that happens if you and another player make similar characters, since they'll be defined by their differences and have some sort of kinship due to their similarities, it can often lead to similar character arcs, which isn't really great in a narrative system like DDA in my opinion. Furthermore, there's the mechanical side of things. Having a variety of mechanical distinctions means that there's less chance the party will get caught with their pants down at any point because they just don't have the skill they need. Definitely aim for that sort of diversity of character. It also makes everyone stand out a little more, lets you cover each other's weaknesses, and everyone has their own moments, you know? It lets everyone, everyone have a moment that feels like their moment in the story. Given the fact that evolution is tied to narrative, and if it's something like the original adventure where you have to exemplify a key trait such as your major aspect to reach perfect or ultimate slash ultimate, whatever you want to call it, you're going to want to have a very distinct character. Finally, it ensures that everyone is ready to go. If the GM takes the time to breathe down the necks of the players during session zero, there's less chance they're going to show up on the actual game day with an incomplete or faulty character. Admittedly, this is one of my pet peeves as a GM, so including it as a bit of, as a bit of an annoyance from me linking through, but screw it, I need to make the point. If you're not willing to do the legwork to get your character ready and be on time for game day, don't bother showing up. At all. Tabletop games require work from everyone involved, the GM has the bulk of it already in the long term, might as well save him trouble in the short term by making the players, you know, actually do the work and keep up with the sheets. He, d he shouldn't have to breathe down your neck, and he shouldn't have to badger you about it. You should be able to manage it your own. I'm assuming most of you are adult. If you're not, why are you watching this video? It's not meant for kids. Huh, <sighs> okay. Rant over. Deep breaths. That out of the way, uh, that uh, that wraps up this section on human character creation. I hope you've enjoyed this video, and uh, next Friday I'm going to try and get part 3 up, which will be Digimon creation. Week after that will be evolution and character advancement, and uh, so on and so forth. I will cover what I'm doing beyond that at that point. If you're interested in DDA and you don't want to wait for the rest of these videos to be uploaded and finished, uh, check out the document below and the WordPress blog. Also, follow me on Twitter for updates on videos and streams, Twitch for the streams themselves from 1 to 2 or 4 to 5 p.m. U.S. Central, however I'm feeling, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to catch the future videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video and learned something useful. Throw a comment down below if you have any other questions and I can do my best to answer them. Uh, thanks for watching. I will see you guys next week. 
when we talk about Digimon creation, aka one of the most fun parts of the game. 